Um, the Belform mining field in Western Tasmania had its origins in 1875 with the discovery of tin by two itinerant prospectors who allegedly were, were pulling a wombat out of a hole. Not quite sure what they were going to do with the wombat, but if they're going to eat it, it was going to be pretty tough. Now, here to tell you all about uh, the hopes and disappointments of this mining field, would you please wave a hand for Scott Clement? So, a lost reward. Just as a, as a start. Won't start. Um, I must say that the presentation based on is based on a much more comprehensive history of the Balfour boom, and I've had to cull a lot of it out to fit it into tonight's time frame, which is even shorter now. And I hope it's not lost too much of its integrity in the process. A couple of other things. I've not edited most of the original maps as that would have been impractical, so don't think you need to read all, all of the notes on them. These location maps were first published in geologist A.K. Ward's 1911 report of fieldwork he did into the mineralogy of the Arthur Pyman region in Western Tasmania over the winter of 1900 and, and, and of 10. Can I ask, can you see that cursor? Yes, we can. Okay, good. Yes, Thank you. It's very, very clear. clear. I've marked on this map the various towns and features that weren't on the original map, just so I can describe a bit of the geography of the area. Um, Mount Bischoff, the mountain of tin, as they called it, is over to the southeast for about 35 miles. And I'll talk in terms of miles if you don't mind. Um, Granville is about 45 miles further down the coast off the, off the map as well. And Temer, which I've not named there, has the alternative name essentially of Wales Head, although uh, essentially the, the little, port is, little port is Wales Head, but Temer is the village that grew up round it. So in the five years after the 1871 discovery of tin at Mount Bischoff, prospectors had moved further south to the Heemskirk, Zeehan and Dundas fields and later to Mount Lyle, but access through the rough country was a major problem. One way was to follow the coast southward from Marawa to the Granville area. Difficult country with two major rivers to cross. What followed were the cattle drives from the northwest farms along sand dunes, remote forest trails, and exposed surf beaches. And the cattle had to swim across the Arthur and Pyman rivers. The punch across the Arthur River came in, in 1878, but it was some time before they were spared from swimming the Pyman. You can see the difficulty of getting on and off that old uh, barge. The route went through Wales Head, the only coastal but still risky port between the two rivers, really little more than a dent in a wild, roaring 40s coast. But some prospectors moved out to explore the country to the east, where there were signs of alluvial tin, in particular along the course of the Franklin River. That's Frank Land, it's not Frank Lynn. Folklore tells that Thomas Lyons and his mate Skelton Emmett discovered tin near Mount Balfour, about 13 miles inland from Wales Head, when pulling a wombat out of a hole in 1875. Assistant Government Geologist A.K. Ward in a report in 1911 noted that the alluvial workings were underway by 1884 and by March 1887 about 500 acres of leases had been taken up by five or six parties, but that sluicing was hampered by lack of water due to dry weather. So over the next few years, Balfour tin workings began to take second place to prospects further to the south. And by 1900, interest in the area had declined to the extent 
that there are only three men working there. Brothers Bill and Tom Murray and Fred Smith discovered copper in Tin Creek and were granted a copper reward lease in December 1901. Smith soon left to be replaced by William Ford and a mysterious fourth partner whom we'll meet later on. Now, it was 1907 before any serious mining began at what became the Copper Reward, or Reward Mine, and it was then worked successfully, but in a small way, although there were periods of low activity from late 1912. Nevertheless, the Reward Mine was destined to become the largest and most important mine on the Balfour field, and to be by far the longest lasting. The 1901 discovery soon encouraged others to prospect the areas north and south of the reward. By 1906, the copper load had been traced for several miles and large areas had been taken up by various lessees. While we've got this up, we'll just show down the copper rewards down here, right at the, almost at the southern, south eastern end of the load. The company we'll meet later on is the Mount Burford Copper Mines is up here. The Tema tram eventually came through there. And this tram, which is uh, the Murray's, Murray Brothers tram, was in fact never built. But the real problems, problem, problems, there were real problems in getting ores out to market. At the time, the only option was to put it into hessian bags and pack houses to Wales Head along a muddy track, sarcastically known as the main road. And I know this is not pack horses, but it wasn't too good for carts either. And there was a serious shortage of ore bags. At that stage, there was no jetty at Wales Head, and horse carts would be backed out from the beach to load vessels anchored out in the bay. You can just see the the stern of a catch there. By mid-1908, there were over 120 men working in the field, mostly in alluvial tin sluicing. But as the Murray brothers were busily, busily working their copper reward lease, the prominence over, of copper over tin at Balfour was growing. Over the winter of 1910, Ward had visited the broader Arthur Pyman mining fields with an emphasis on Balfour, and his extensive report was published as the formal Mines Department Geological Survey Bulletin Number 10 in 1911. In his appraisal of the history of the field, or the then history of the field, he wrote that interest reached a high point in late 1909, but most of the mines were undercapitalized, and that actual mining did not reflect the prominence the field was enjoying in the share market prophetic words. He also noted that even those companies which had tried to properly prove their mines could be badly hampered by poor, poor transport options. However, he forecast that with the completion of the Tema tram, a new era in the history of copper mining should begin. But viewed from 1910, this tram was over a year away yet. By 1908, the Murrays had accumulated at least 15 leases at or near Balfour. Ward indicated the spread of these, many of which to pr would prove of little consequence. But lease number 123M, which is in here, the 80 acre reward lease itself was reported on in depth and stated to be the most important in the field. The copper reward, in fact, also all was held its position as the major mine, but even it had trouble getting its ores away. The reward partners were lobbying for their own tramway to the coast and stated to the press that they'd applied for an easement for one, and this they had practically obtained. I'll just look at this for a few minutes or for a moment. Um, this is about the 
Tamatran, although there was a major deviation in there during construction. This is the tram from the Balfour, the uh, Murray Brothers tram that was never built. Tamar was out here, and you can see how open this little harbour was to the southwesterlies. Tamar, the small settlement of Wales Head, had become an established but still isolated town by 1908 when a hotel was opened by Ted Cartledge and Fred Smith had been an early partner in the reward. It was a busy hub for those traveling to and from Marawa, Balfour and Granville further down the coast. But as the Balfour field rapidly developed, the whole question of transport to Temer was becoming more and more critical. The only real winners were the horse teams with their costly charges to trudge out along the main road. A public meeting was held at the Mount Balfour Hotel in March 1909 to discuss this problem of transport. It was after to demand that the government provide money for Tarata Track to be made suitable for horse traffic. It was virtually important, Im impassable for horse because of, uh, of uh, generally trees falling across it and other flooding problems. That track, Bill Murray said, puts Balfour within an easy day's ride of Stanley, whereas the Wales head to Marawa route takes two long days. And the main road was heavily criticised, with the meet, meeting resolving that the government should be asked to make budgetary provision of £5,000 for the road to be made fit for traffic. As Bill Murray said, it took seven horses to pull one tonne of freight over it, and that the government received over £400 income from the field, a decent outlet was warranted. The current charges of £2.10 a tonne were exorbitant, the road was in a disgraceful condition, and the £400 voted by the government for its repair would not fix more than half a mile. And the minister should be asked to have the bridges uh, constructed across the Arthur and Franklin rivers at once, as had been provided for in Parliament the year before. At least a proposal was received for a three foot six gauge tramway from Stanley. This of course received enthusiastic report, but as we'll see later, this was to suffer many pie in the sky sagas for many years yet. A motion was also passed to ask the government to send a geologist to report on the Balfour field. At least this was more hastily answered in the point the appointment of Ward to do just that. Also on the positive side, there was one item that looked as if someone at Balfour might move unilaterally. Surveyor Sale had already come to Balfour to do a survey of a route for the Murray Brothers tram to Temer. In the early 1900s, the number of prospectors and hopefuls grew and their families inevitably followed, with the Balfour Township becoming the main centre. By, mining, by 1909, mining syndicates had taken out lots totalling over 10,000 acres and Balfour's population had grown to about 900. There was a police station with a lock-up and that's the lock-up on the left it's not what it otherwise looks like. The Mount Balfour Hotel and the grandiose Imperial Hotel to follow in the next year. There were quite a few houses, some seen as palatial, such as Bill Murray's marital home, cynically called the mansion by his brother Tom, with others left in just serviceable shacks. But many of the single miners lived in tents, some in town, but others out on the leases themselves or away on the subfields. By 1910, there was a school initially started by Tom, Anderson's, Tom, Tom Anderson's wife and held in a tent. And by 1911, a more formal one-teacher school under Oscar McCall 
with an enrollment of 29 children. Now, as was normally the case in Australian mining towns, where service providers are the real money makers, Frank Gaffney became the leading businessman in town. He owned the Imperial, the general store, the bakery, butchery, post office, bank agency, blacksmithy and livery stables. And he also had the mail contract employing Morris Cartledge as his writer. And that's the Imperial Hotel, which is a copy of the, of the main, one of the main hotels in Smithton. And that, believe it or not, is the general store. But from 1912, that was effectively the peak of the boom, only the more promising leases were being worked. It was very mixed success. Before long, there would be few of them left. But at least the Murrays and some others pressed on. Although the government's Balfour to Temer tram is by far the best remembered, it was certainly not the first tram on in the field. The company advertised in a big bundle of term two pages. Apart from some minor man powered mine trams, there was a two foot gauged steel rail, rail jetty tram at Temer dating from mid-1910, but it was only very local to the town. The first significant tram to appear was that of the Balfour Sawmilling and Tramway Company. The basis of this chart is as one of a series of 390 master prints held by the former Lands Department of Tasmania as working documents and were animated by, annotated by members of the department, being records of grants and properties in various towns with amendments made over the years. The dates of the amendments on this chart run from 1909 to 1927, except for a few shown as yellow as late as the 1980s. It is the only information of the route of this tram that I've located. However, parts of the route shown a demonstrably wrong. There's considerable doubt as to whether the tram ever extended beyond Balfour Township itself, or if the officer involved may have made, uh, may have made mistakes, misunderstanding the facts. The mill itself was, set in the, set, was sited near the northeastern end of town, up in here not far from the then New Franklin River Bridge on the Tramata, Tramata Track. The sawmill company transported an eight-tonne engine for 140 miles from Burnie to Balfour with the Arthur River punt, the sand dunes and the muddy main road to contend with. And that had taken 15 days. The company advertised in 1909 that it would be in a position to supply the Balfour field with timber and firewood as soon as their two-foot tramway to the township was finished. And the first few loads of timber left the mill in mid-March 1910, over 14 months before the coming timber tram. However, despite the difficulty of getting their eight-tonne engine to Balfour in the first place, the sawmills to see a very short life. It was largely passed over for the supply of timber for the coming timber tram. Then near tragedy came in February 1911 when the mill was nearly lost in bushfires that raged around the area for several days. It was the last straw and the mill was relocated near Rosebury, many miles from Balfour. So another long trip for the engine. There was also a sawmill about two miles from Temer built by Charles Dearden. Dearden had a long experience in the railway and timber industries in Tasmania, including being the supervisor and construction manager of the troubled, troubled Hopeton Mill at Port Esperance. He then became associated with the Tasmanian Company of Jones & Co, perhaps best remembered for jams, for which he built this sawmill. 
essentially on the route of the coming Pema tram. He just completed this mill when he took ill, was rushed to hospital in Launceston in September 1910, and he died there at 72. Jones and Co. then assumed direct control, but the mill soon suffered a major mechanical failure when a piston burst through a cylinder, putting it out of use for some time. The company decided to supply timber from its mills at Smithton and down south, leaving the Balfour Sawmilling Company out in the cold. At about the end of 1909, the Murray brothers commissioned a Mr. Sale to run a survey for a tramway from Balfour to Temma. His proposed route, route left the reward line in a wide arc swinging to the south and west through several of the Murray's other leases, as we saw earlier. The tram was to be about 13 and a half miles long, of two foot gauge with wooden rails. Tended to call, but costs had been grossly underestimated. And with the government tram in the wind, the project was put in hold and was never built. In parallel with the Murray Brothers' proposals, there'd been heavy lobbying for the government to build a tram running from Balfour to Temma. And at about the same time, there were proposals to build a railway from Stanley for about 53 miles inland to Balfour. However, if this, if this was ever going to eventuate, it would not be completed for some years yet. We've seen this map before, so I won't have... The surveyor for the, Temer, for the government tram, Adams, proposed a horse-drawn two-foot six-gauge line, 13 and a quarter miles long. His estimate was 6,750 pounds. His trial route normally ran across open button grass or lightly forested country, commencing adjacent to Tin Creek, half a mile south of Balfour Township, and running to the Tema Jetty. This is the first part of his, uh, his trial survey. I, I haven't shown the, the rest, the other sheets, but this gives you an indicate from the reward mine down here up to the Nelson Bay rivulet. Rails were to be four inches by three inch hardwood, topped with myrtle on the running surface, surface, timbers that were available locally. Along the line, there would be five passing sidings, spaced about one and a half to two and a half miles apart. Wood had completed his actual field research the previous August, but with access to Adam's plan, he'd been able to describe it in his 1911 report. But he did not show any deviations adopted during construction. Parliament voted £7,000 for construction of the line, with the minister noted, noting that the due, the due to the high cost of 10 shillings a day for labour, it would be built by day labour as urgent work. He also noted that construction of the line would not prejudice the prospects of a large one from Stanley to Balfour. William Guy Andrew Arthur, who had extensive experience in railway tramway construction in Tasmania, was appointed as General Overseer of Construction. He arrived at Tamar on the 5th of October 1910 and said that various plant and equipment was due to leave Launceston for Stanley on that same day. In fact, in fact, Work began on the day after his arrival with clearing and ploughing rough formation for about three quarters of a mile. Rapid progress indeed. But it was basically sandy country and there were no significant cuttings or embankments, although even minor sandy, sandy formation slopes still had to be stabilised with turfing and tea tree scrub. And Arthur was also quickly appraising the difficulties of construction further on, proposing route changes, 
in places and variable methods of construction to suit changeable ground and drainage conditions. There was a lack of suitable ballast in some extensive sections and he proposed using split timber slabbing so horses hooves would not wear trenches between the rails. And this is an example of that, although the near part of this is a crossing of a, of a creek, but in the distance you can see the slabbing. He also decided that it would be better to avoid Adam's trial line down into and out of the valley of Big Eel Creek. He's down in here. This was, in fact, the major route deviation. And there were problems crossing the boggy Nelson Bay River flats for three quarters of a mile, particularly with its drainage and base. And this also needed slabbing. This, incidentally, is the first of the four photographs that I got from, uh, from uh, Jim Stokes. There were also problems at the Balfour end where there was no alternative to run it up the bed of Tin Creek. Flooding was inevitable. And this load, it being the trailing load there is being pulled by six horses there. There was good running southeastwards down the section from Nelson Bay River Flats towards Tin Creek with well ballasted track. All in all, progress was amazingly fast with construction working from both ends and took just 34 weeks. Work was also going ahead building the rolling stock, despite problems in the late supply of wheel sets. Eventually, there were to be 18 double bogey trucks and one 10 passenger vehicle. On the 20th of May, Andrew Arthur reported that the passenger vehicle had been trialled from Temer to Balfour with two of the light horses driven by Tom Anderson, comfortably taking just two hours. With one pigsty pier and at least eight flimsy trestles, is it any wonder that the photographer here was so keen to be first to get to the other side? A shed was erected at each end and at the halfway point. That at Temer was 45 feet by 25 feet, and there were sliding doors at each end. It apparently had two tracks inside, one of which abutted a platform, and at least one ran out onto the jetty, where it was composite with a two-foot gauge jetty train. The Balfour shed was smaller and opposite the reward mine, but this was half a mile from the township, much to the continuing annoyance of the townspeople. At the start of June 1911, Andrew Arthur notified the Minister for Lands that the tramway is now ready for handing over to the Circuit Head Council. The council was in turn to lease it the Murrays at £100 a year. The Murrays had in fact been involved in testing the line with the results included in Andrew Arthur's report. The official, open, official opening took the form of a gala day at Temer, with three trams leaving Balfour from 7.30am, travelling in convoy, carrying some 55 people, and they were joined by others coming down from Maroa with the beer. Entertainment took in a football match, a children's picnic, and an early evening dance. A good time was had by all with the last rowdy tram arriving back at Balfour about 7pm. The date was the 3rd of June, 1911, and being only 18 days before the winter solstice, it would have been well into the dark, but probably no one noticed. What was to become known as the Tamar Tram was initially a great success, with 16 horses able to deliver 12 tonnes of ore a day and that compared with the previous 26 pack horse rate of seven tonnes a day, and that on a two-day journey, and only when the old track was passable. Travelling along the old main road was now over, at least for the time being, but there was still discontent among the townspeople 
about the distance they had to walk to catch the tram out to Tema. In early January 1912, a petition signed by 47 residents of Balfour was presented to the government praying that the tram be extended into town. The government minister answered that he'd sought advice from Andrew Arthur, who was by then working on the extension of the TGR Western Line from Myala towards Wiltshire Junction. Andrew Arthur was asked if it might be practical to use the now abandoned sawmill tram to affect that link. But he answered that there would be many difficulties as it was in a very bad condition with rotten rails, was a different gauge and at most was worth, in, worth, no, worth no more than 50 pounds. And of course, there was a doubt if it ever went any further south than the town anyway. But soon the matter was just academic anyway. The boom was failing, bushfires, poor maintenance and flooding hit the Temma tram and its future became problematic. And even by the onset of the Great War, it had badly deteriorated. There was some reprieve with limited maintenance and repair from time to time, but it was, almost, it was now always to be something of a white elephant. Through and beyond the war, the field, the field became less and less active, ironically mainly reverting to tin sluicing. The only serious copper workings were based at the reward mine, but even it was in serious trouble. Bill Murray committed suicide in late 1912, and Tom soon became despondent and slept away from managing the mine. Some said that he ended his days tramping around the, belt, the circular head region. The reward fell into the hands of the mystery fourth partner. American Robert Carl Stick was the senior metallurgist and manager of the Mount Lyell mine and he was renowned for developing the problematic pyritic smelling process. He had a continuing involvement in the Balfour field, initially through various Mount Lyle leases near to the south of the reward, but later in a private capacity. Dick was the most highly paid person in Tasmania, but his Balfour ventures were something of a disaster for him. It is said that he lost over £70,000 on them, an absolute fortune in those days. After Bill Murray's death, his brother Tom first took over the management of the reward, but his heart was no longer in it, and it then fell to Luke Williams, and then to six 20-year-old oldest son, Bob. But things were barely productive, and hopes for the installation of a flotation process never came to be. By 1901, it had closed down due to very low copper prices and rising labour costs, and Bob had to reluctantly pay the men off. But he still had some hopes for the future, but the die was cast, and Carl Stick's health was failing. He died in hospital in Launceston in early 1922, after which his wife Marion moved to Balfour with their two oldest sons, Bob and Hadmar in an attempt to recover the family's losses, but to no avail. There was no alternative other than to abandon the mine. Now, I've added this slide in because it's an interesting slide. It was taken by Stick's second son, Hadmar, in about 1923. It's looking towards the southeast, showing the reward mine in its last years. Note the remains of what appears to be a dual gauge track running up the slope to the mine buildings. This may be evidence that both the two-foot gauge sawmill tram and the two-foot six-gauge Temma tram once ran to the mine. In the right background is Mount Hazelden, Mark X, which in the boom days had its own subfield, including several leases held by Mount Lyle Company, and which were six first interest in the Balfour field. The Mount Balfour Copper Mines Company and the Stanley Balfour Railway. 
As Williams the reward mine, Ward had identified others having potential on the Balfour field, but that most had been yet had yet to be properly proven. And soon after, most of them had failed or been abandoned anyway. An exception was the Mount Balfour Copper Mines Company Limited, located at the northwestern end of the load. Floated in February 1909 and promoted by A. E. Langford of Melbourne, it claimed to have the best prospects on the field. With plans for a major mine and two hydroelectric power stations to power an electric railway to Stanley and a copper smelter near Balfour. We've seen this before. As there was some confusion between clashing names of different city, uh, different entities at Balfour, I'll refer to the Mount Balfour Copper Mines Company from now on as the company. The company held several adjacent leases near to the clump, about five miles northwest of Balfour. However, there were some serious problems of access. The Tema tram would be of limited use, as there would still be the need to build a five mile link to Balfour, and its capacity would be limited anyway. The solution was seen as a railway to a central sheltered port on the northern coast. At the same time, the fledgling Circular Head Municipal Council was keen to take advantage of a new government scheme to set aside monies towards loans for trial surveys for local tramways to open up rural districts. Now you might get, you can see the reason why it was called Circular Head. The was here was not in fact out at the end of the peninsula, but it was in here. Stanley was in here. The council was proposing a tramway running from Stanley to Tawata, about 25 miles inland to the southwest. To commit to such a loan would require approval through a ratepayer poll, and a successful one followed in May 1909. And such, a line could all, and such a line could always be extended to benefit the then burgeoning Balfour Field. So the company began to strongly lobby the council, the government and the community at large to let it join in on the plan. Now, there was something of the local divide between Stanley and Smithton, and partly because of this, nothing was going to happen in a hurry. On the board of the company was a Swede, Dr H.P. Eckberg, he was fated as an experienced world and Australian mining expert, although the veracity of these claims is rather difficult to pin down. In fact, he soon proved to be an expert at being an expert. He visited the mine site in 1909, reporting that there was an extensive quartz ore body rich in copper and with showings of gold and silver. This photo is actually taken later than that, minute, that visit. Test cross trenches and indicated samples with average assays said to be of extraordinary richness. A gross value of over £117,000 was indicated, but the real riches lay below. There were indications of 54,000 tonnes of ore available smelting, excluding the precious metals. This was just the sort of thing the board wanted to hear. How could the company possibly fail? The company's first, first half yearly meeting was held at the end of July and it was clear that it was shooting for the stars. The council, the government and the community was very much on side. In the first week of October, Langford and Eckberg visited the field together and reported back on plans for the company's mine development and for raising capital. And early the next month, the company notified the press of its intention to apply for an act to carry out its works. So the company seriously began to seek capital in the investment market, beginning a drawn out saga that eventually was exposed all sorts of incompetence. Longford stated that a powerful group of London capitalists 
requested that the mines be placed under offer at once, but he left the rest of it hanging. At the same time, providing more capital from within the current shareholding and to protect them from being swamped, the first of several shareholding, share restructurings was announced. But of course, the mine needed to be productive and for other mines to take advantage of its smelter and its railway. And this had clearly not been confirmed. And there'd been early um, there had been an earlier unproductive exploratory trenches done by another company, and the leases had been abandoned. Perhaps that alone should have invited caution. But the company seemed to be blinded by its own enthusiasm. While there were still problems with transport to be faced, it was confident that a railway to Stanley was the answer. Eckberg travelled to Hobart to lobby the state premier to seek an act, but formal notice was not given for another nine months, and the Stanley to Balfour Railway Act would not follow until December 1910, still 13 months away. Eckberg would not give an estimate of the cost of the line, but he was confident that they would not be above average, as no hills would be encountered until south of the Arthur, and these would not be difficult. But as we'll soon see, there'd be at least one difficult climb of nearly three miles. Eckberg confident, was confident that with an act, building of smelters would quickly follow, and the overall project would benefit not only the other mines on the field, but the district agricultural industry as well. So the stage is now set on the company to join in with the council on the northern half of the railway. Our wheels were still turning slowly and there's still many hurdles to cross. Not the least of these was, was the parochialism between Stanley and Smithton. Leading the Smithton lobby was Archibald Ford, who was the driving force behind the Marawai Tramway Company. Ford claimed that the Sandy based council was unfairly biased towards the Balfour Railway proposal to the detriment of his tramway. So he travelled to Hobart to meet with Minister Heen and in questioning the bony fighters of the pole, succeeding in having another one ordered. This, of course, put the council in an awkward position and its response was swift and decisive, seeing a deputation to Hobart insisting that everything concerning the Maypole had been properly conducted. The case was well put, and Heen agreed that the surveys could be commenced at once. The deputation went home to Stanley Victorious, and by February 1910, two, survey sur two separate survey parties were on the job. They had been instructed to adopt a three foot six gauge to limit grades to one in 40 and curves to five change minimum not particularly on his conditions on the Tasmanian scene. And the council saw that cooperation with the company was needed to achieve their tramway to Tawata. In 19, July 1910, the company at last gave formal notice that was applied to the parliament for an, enabling, for an enabling act. It was not until 7th of December that the bill had been passed. This is an extract from the application that was made. Don't bother trying to read it. It, uh, it has the essential points in there. Many pointed out there were some provisions in the act that seemed to put both the council and the government at risk, the risk that was in fact destined to come back to bite them. It was summarised in the press in the new year. It stipulated the route planning for the railway through to Balfour and for branches to Smithton and to Brickmakers Bay. There was authority included to develop the harbour at Stanley. The government could lend £10,000 to the company via the council providing that a second poll of ratepayers was taken agreeing to the terms of the Act. 
Construction of the railway must start within 12 months and should be completed within three years. By then, the trial servo is reaching, stretching well beyond the Duck River and both the Arthur and Franklin Rivers power, rivers power Station dam sites have been determined. So a second poll was held on the 28th of March 1911 and resulted in an overwhelmingly positive result. As the local press said, and so pleased was Stanley that the band played through the streets until after midnight. Nothing like the delirium of the public joy displayed that occurred since the relief of Mafeking. The company needed now, now to set about confirming capital, but it was now facing a growing fate in the Balfour boom. Under the government loan of £10,000, the company was keen to get started and shareholders were being told that up to £250 would be needed, but that was soon seen to be quite inadequate. Nature was adept at making throwaway statements on costs and levels of capital required, seemingly dependent on the tactical needs of the moment. Only a month later, he said that over £600,000 would be sought. This dramatic increase may have reflected the engagement what Langford described as one of the best engineers in the world in the London engineering firm of Mertz McClellan to invest in proposals for both the power generation and the railway. At the time, their man R.P. Wilson said to be in Melbourne regarding the electrification of the suburban railways, although the scope of the services to our company does not seem to have been very well defined, even if it was defined at all. Now, for Wilson had much bigger fish to fry in completing his Victorian report, he did issue, a, did issue a draft report that addressed the company's ideas. And no doubt the company saw such a prestigious firm as lending considerable kudos to its plans. Langford then announced that he and then company solicitor Hickton Donald would be going to England to raise capital and that shareholders would still soon be presented with a scheme for the company's reorganisation. Now, it was to be some time before they actually set sail. On the 3rd of May 1911, construction of the railway got on to perhaps premature start when the state government turned the first sod at Stanley. Progress was very slight, but at least the company had complied with the act to start construction within 12 months. But completion within three years would be another story. But what was the railway's route to be? The actual proposal for the northern section of the railway was much as for the Stanley to Tawata Railway, a TGI loan opened in 1919. However, any detailed data of the route beyond the Duck River has been difficult to locate and has been limited to just two sections and a couple of photos. After crossing the Duck River at 26 miles from Stanley, and the Roger River at about 29 miles, the Arthur River will be reached at 35 to 34 and a half miles in a point known as Eckberg's Camp. Data for this part of the route was found on an ink and pencil field sketch showing three sequential line traverses titled Onward from Roger River and totaling five miles, 26 chains over low-lying country with many sinkholes. The, the railway itself would have to have been located further to the east. It was at the Arthur that the first major bridge would be needed. This was about a mile downstream from the old bridge crossing of the then Balfour track, basically at the site of the current day Canona Bridge on Sumac Road.
The Arthur River Dam site was supposed to be a further mile or so upstream from that bridge site and more to be banked up for about another three and a half miles in a relatively narrow gorge. The grades of the line through the rich agricultural country as far as the Arthur River and generally undeveloped land for about three miles beyond it would be relatively easy. But from there followed a nearly three mile steep climb to a saddle in the Arthur Franklin Rivers Divide, reaching the summit of the line at 40 miles from Stanley. Details of this climb were found comprising four sequential drawings of longitudinal sections, showing enough geographical features for their locations to be identified. And these are quite well developed in conventional engineering drawings and cover the section from about 37 miles south from Stanley, excuse me, south from Stanley for the next four miles. This first drawing shows that the section approaching the start of the climb will be gradual for the first eight chains, but then increase to one and 45, they're on 43 for the nearly three miles to the summit. No curves, are indicated for the first 35 chains, although some would have been needed. But thereafter, there are numerous reversing curves, two or four change radius, and 26 of five chains up to the summit. One 15 chain long embankment, which is this one here, on this first drawing showed an estimated borrow volume of nearly 16,000 cubic yards with a comment added by the surveyor that this might be reduced to 3,200 cubic yards with a possible realignment, but presumably at the expense of more curves and length. From this first drawing, I've been able to plot a section comprising the two four-chain radius curves flanked by five-chain curves. Well, most of these four and five-chain curves are fairly long, so they went through a fair angle. The climb is identifiable as being above the old Balfour track, which is down here. And the, and the adjacent Stevens rivulet is down there as well. Although it was certainly the most difficult section to be encountered on the railway, it would have been with the load of the Spectre trains making for the coast. From the summit, the line would drop, after which you'd cross poor country to arrive at the Franklin River crossing at the clump, close to the company's mine site. From there to Balfour itself, the route could then continue for about five miles to the southeast. So while the route of the railway's design was being developed from 1911, Still no solutions to the problem of raising cattle. By mid May 1911, Langford, in mid May 1911, Langford chair a meeting, chaired a meeting of shareholders, at which the council's warden Plummer and solicitor Lawton enthusiastically presented their proposed arrangements with the company. The meeting gave Langford and McDonald considerable freedom to negotiate with financiers when in London. And Langford was now openly saying that over £600,000 of capital would be sought and that it requires very careful handling. And as we shall be associated with men of great financial genius, we will certainly listen to their advice. We have to meet one gentleman in London who exercises a great deal of power there and who has investigated the whole proposition and has personally inspected all of our concessions and has undertaken to give me a report in London he's absolutely refused to give a report here. This gentleman was almost certainly R.P. Wilson of Bruce McClellan, although his importance in London was probably being exaggerated. But Langford's silver tongue words were perhaps starting to lose their authority. In answer to a rather pointed question from a shareholder, he took a somewhat aggressive stance. I think Mr Shields and also the other shareholders know that we have made no statements from the inception of this company 
that have not been fully borne out. But of course, did this statement have our overall capacity? It would seem not. And the suggestion of hiding the facts from the ordinary shareholders was destined to fester for the remaining life of the company. Bank of MacDonald left for London sometime after mid-1911, but no real indication progress in came, came until mid-December. But there was again great celebration in Stanley following news that the, of the flotation of the Mount Balfour Copper Mines and Railway Company. However, for the moment, details were sparse, and it was not until the next April 1912 that in a form, any formal announcement was made. Langford has retur had returned as the attorney for the Tasmanian Railway and General Trust Limited. The Trust, a new company it had assured would provide capital from the railway's construction, as well as for the overall project. And Mr. Bevel Sharp was to be the consulting engineer of the railway and was to take over the entire control of construction of the work then being carried out at Stanley. Sharp soon arrived and went on a three-day trip along the railway's total proposed route, accompanied by Langford and E.W. Stevens, who until then had been the engineer in charge of, in charge of the construction. E.W. E. Stevens would, in fact, retain his position with the project and was later to be the TGR's construction engineer on the Stanley to, to Rutland Railway, completed in 1919. There was plenty of opposition to the scheme and for the company to be granted any, for, for more, any further concessions. And at the council meeting in late 1912, a request had been discussed for the company to be granted concessions over 100,000 acres of timber country near the Arthur River. Perhaps timber and land use were, were being seen as a possible alternative for mining for the company. His capital raising was not going well. Then an option held by the Trust expired at the end of December 1912 and support from London was suspended. His shareholders still kept in the dark. The company then said it was negotiating with another group to, to raise capital and another restructuring of shares was proposed. Details revealed late in March that the other group was the Australasian Guarantee Corporation of Sydney, AGC. And don't confuse this with the later, now defunct, Australian Guarantee Corporation, AGC. Under an option, our AGC was required to find investors to put up £200,000, still far short of the total required, and of this, £160,000 was to be paid to the company, but of course owned mine. And one half of the first public issue of shares was to be offered to the trust. Sounds a bit incestuous to me. This option would expire on the 30th of October 1913. And then on 4th of April 1913, another restructuring of shares was outlined. On the 11th of July, the Sydney Morning Herald reported on a meeting between the company directors and the Tasmanian Minister for Mines in Melbourne. Restarting work was discussed at length with the directors assuring the minister that they were able to fully comply with the Act. They also sought further extension of concessions with the idea of developing their immigration scheme although no details have been found as to what on earth that meant. And none of these hopes were to prove sustainable. Despite these difficulties, work on site restarted, and by July 1913, some further progress was recorded from the port into and marginally southward from Stanley. Work done over the fortnight up to the 19th of July showed that plate laying and ballasting were completed to 60 chains, and that, of course, is only three quarters of a mile. And that 25 tonnes of rail would arrive on the 25th and another 50 a week later. And that, the assumption that these rails would be 40 pounds a yard, 75 tonnes would only be sufficient to cover about one mile, 
15 change, not much more than from the wharf to the Stanley Station site. Further, tenders will be called for the 73 chains of earthworks, which would take the front to, to about 23 and three quarter miles. Up until the 2nd of August, other reports detail progress. Plate laying continued up to the flood opening. When this is finished, rails will be carried on to one mile 70 chains. Culverts and bridges will be completed out to 10 miles. At much the same time, the company asked the Mount Lyle Company if it could sell or lease it a construction locomotive, but was told that all their three foot six gauge locos were needed. These would have been three Baldwin 060 saddle tanks, of which this is number five. Ironically, no, number five Baldwin was later used as construction locomotive on the TGR extension of Western Line from Myala to join the Triotra the Trowata line at Wiltshire Junction. It's not known if approaches are made elsewhere, but in view of the power state, financial state that was still growing, it would seem extremely unlikely. The warden, the warden reported to the council meeting on the 9th of August that a definite move was now being made, and the company said that it would open the line to Phase Lane at about 14 and a half miles by Christmas. Now, did this mean that impossible Christmas deadlines were already around as early as 1913? He also understood that 18, 800 tonnes of rail was in order from America. This would be enough to lay about 12 and three quarter miles of track. That might just be sufficient to reach Foe's Lane. But on a negative note, he also stated that the company would require an extension of time of two years. But funds were rapidly drying up. Perhaps yet not, all was not yet lost. There was more hope in August with the news that the company had been sold to a French group with a capital of 1.1 million pounds. But caution arose when it became clear that this new company would be registered in Brussels and not Paris, and that English capital would import, would input would be expected. The reported broker of the deal was named as J. Earl Herman and Company of Sydney. The proposed taking over all of the concessions held by the company and supply finances at a rate of £10,000 a month. But the Herman connection was soon shown to be not as good as it first appeared. It was later revealed that Herman was something of a shady character. He appeared before the Central Criminal Court of New South Wales in 1914 to answer several charges of forgery, forgery totaling £10,200. And this was, in fact, not the first or last time he'd been in trouble. He'd been in trouble back in about 1909. It was said in this court that he suffered from epileptic insanity. So by the third quarter in 1913, although the wheels had not totally fallen off, they were coming very wobbly. The October deadline for AGC's option expired without result and shareholders were becoming more and more agitated. Kenrick Lord reported to the November Council meeting of the company's situation. Outlining the current railway expenditure, he said there had been agitation against the company, but he didn't see why. He was doing his very best, and this agitation was hurting the flotation. He reported that the company had spent £22,000 on the railway and £51,000 in total on the whole project, including at the mine. However, this agitation reflected a loss in public confidence, particularly among some, among some of the locals who were waiting for compensation for land acquisition and payment of other debts. In a December public meeting in the Forest Hall, a strong resolution demanding payment was passed. On the 11th of December 1913, Parliament reluctantly agreed to a two-year extension of time. 
In Melbourne on the very same day, a special meeting of the company was held to expose all sorts of failures and caused considerable acrimony among the shareholders. They were again claiming that they'd been continuously kept in the dark, even when there'd been positive developments to be reported. And they had not been told of the October default of the AGC option until this meeting. Yes, this had been a prime hope for raising at least some capital. The main critical shareholder was an EJ Core, who claimed there was now a real lack of confidence in the company and its in the directors. And he seriously questioned the bona fides of this J. Earl Herman. There was no real evidence of any Brussels deal other than a very questionable telegram, he said, and the attempts to get more details had apparently been met with rebuff from Herman. The telegram did not even say that the company had been floated. It was vague and was far from business like. The chairman asked if he could add anything more regarding the new flotation. He replied that when he had asked Herman for the name of someone who could with whom he communicated, received a very terse telegram. Foolish interference responsible for the last unfortunate happenings in London, therefore inadvisable to interfere further. I'll keep you fully and completely posted. And of course, Kerr's understandably pithy response was that the directors had been humbugged. By now, the meeting had become very aggressive and the chairman countered by saying that his resignation had been in the hands of directors for some time, pending an election in January, and the board would be pleased to welcome others to the field then. With regards to the railway's construction, he had no option but to tell the meeting that work had again had to cease last Monday, and that was the 8th of December 1913. Paul then successfully moved an amendment that the meeting be adjourned until the following week. By now, the press was having a field day. The oscillation in Melbourne in its mining gossip column found some more contradictory issues in Herman's proposal. And after the adjourned meeting was held the following week, the Sydney Daily Telegraph reported under a rather cynical headline, Mount Bowful Tangle. At that meeting, the new chairman had sought further capital by means of increasing the amount payable on 25,000 shares from £10 to £11. But for this to pass, two-thirds of the shareholders needed to be present, and in view of the large number of small shareholders, this was never going to happen. And Lincoln was starting to backtrack and flagging the possibility of truncating the railway, saying that with only another 17 miles of work to Duck River, the railway would become a valuable paying concern. This implied that the formation had only reached nine miles. It seemed to be shrinking. And no plate laying, no plate laying had happened much past Stanley Station site. The gap would require 17 miles of formation and another 1,700 tonnes of rail to be bought and laid. Having achieved little, the meeting was again adjourned until the new year. But perhaps to yet another exclusion of the lesser shareholders, there was a meeting of the principal shareholders held on the following Monday. At this private meeting of shareholders, as the press dubbed it, it was determined that an even more controversial amount could be paid on share, could be payable on shares, but it was never to be. The date of the adjourned meeting arrived early in the new year. But on that day, this had to be preceded by the AGM. The chairman noted at the previous meeting there had been requests for financial details to be revealed. But the company's financial year had only closed on the 31st of December, leaving only six days through the holiday bank break to prepare the balance sheet. And as the auditors were away on holiday, it had been impossible to have it audited but it would be done as soon as they returned. This would seem to have been rather incompetent planning, or perhaps another example of the directors holding things close to their chest. 
The board elections then resulted in success for Langford, Corr, Lawson, among others. Corr subsequently became chairman. Some irony, as he'd previously been the company's main critical shareholder. He was then determined to complete and equip the railway as far as Menga and harvest timber out towards the 13 mile point of the survey. Now, Menga wasn't as far out, isn't as far out as Faye's Lane. So to reach Balfour, the Balfour field seemed to become an impossible dream. It was clear that the company was now losing the confidence of its former strongest allies, allies, the council and the government. There was a great deal of cynicism shown at the council meeting in mid-February. As far as it was concerned, the company's actions were seen as a breach, as a distinct breach of faith. As a last-ditch appeal, board members Darling and Langford met with Minister Mulcahy and Hobart on the 24th of February 1914, still pressing the argument that finance was assured. They told Mulcahy that Herman's representative would soon call on him. For them to be still putting their faith in Herman would seem to be incredible. Or did they still not know? But the die was cast. It was clear that the council and the government thought they'd heard of all before. So in mid May 1914, the council resolved to write to the minister asking that the company should be made to surrender all its rights. The government concurred, and this was to effectively spell the end of the Mount Balfour Copper Mining Company, or at least of its projected Stanley Balfour Railway project. The government took the matter to the Tasmanian full Supreme Court, which handed down a judgment in mid-September, basically an order for the rights of the company in the railway. And this is the act of forfeiture. This led to an act of forfeiture being passed in Parliament for an, for an act that also authorised the TGR to construct its Stanley to Toronto Railway. The government agreed to refund the railway, a fair value for the plant and work done, and shareholders were still complaining that being kept, continually kept in the dark. There was still the government loan of £10,000 to be repaid, but subsequent negotiations with other major creditors were to result in some relief. A debt of £9,700 to the trust was set up for £3,900, and the venture holders claiming £800 had to, accept, had to accept 600 And of course, these monies were coming from the, uh, from the money that the government had paid for the work. In the end, the company was left with a credit balance of just under uh, £3,000. But with all this, the directors were still keen to develop the mine and still intended to put the case to shareholders, but they were having nothing of it. Immediately after the court judgment, the Minister for Railways, Joseph Lyons, who ironically had been born in Stanley in 1879, and who was later to be Australia's Prime Minister, had taken possession of the railway and its formation as far as it existed. In a final irony, he was a nephew of Thomas Lyons, who, with his partner, Skelt Nimmit, had pulled that fateful wombat out of that hole in 1875. But then the world went to war. And after a further three-year hiatus, the company went into liquidation. And the whole sorry debacle was over. Got that there now? Yes. Billy, are you there? I am here. Yes. Uh -huh. Good. I am here. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Scott, for that presentation. Uh, quite interesting. And that all the pros and cons and things that have gone on and uh, the great hopes that many people had and that never came to a reality. 
Um, anybody got any questions? Oh. <laughs> uh, Come on. Don't be shy. <laughs> hey. You can unmute yourselves by pressing the space bar if you wish to speak. Yeah. Hey, you, uh, Scott, you said that um, this was a cut down presentation. Yes. Um, I've written this up much more comprehensively. Yeah. It's, it would certainly not have fixed it, fitted in to this time frame. Um, but it covers much more of the involvement of particular people in the in the two proposals. Um, well the two possibly tramways and railways. And uh, also a lot of extra information on the stick family and well, a number of other things like that. Yeah. Um, I have had I have hopes of having it published, but we'll see what happens with that. Yeah. No, it's um, yeah, quite interesting. And in the middle of it, there was a uh, a, a Melbourne Tate train. Yes, I, I've missed the what the connection was there. Oh, it was basically because um, I won't try and find it. And um, basically because um, the company had engaged uh, Merz McClellan to advise on its railway and and, and power stations. Uh, and it, as it happened, the Merch McClellan uh, representative was in Melbourne at the time, writing up a report on the uh, electrification of the suburban railways. Mm -hmm. That was really the, really the issue there. Yeah. Uh, in fact, he, he refused... I can't remember his name now. Uh, this fellow refused to uh, give a substantial report on what he'd done uh, until he said he would give a better report when he got back to London, but it's rather doubtful whether he ever did. And I'm talking about the report with respect to the, uh, the company's requirements. Right. Yeah. Now, all interesting. Um, any questions? Ah, well, I think you've satisfied everyone, Scott. Well, I don't know. I think it was a very sorry to interrupt, but I think it's a very interesting, very obscure subject. I'm just fascinated about what went on in in a part of the world I don't know anything about. Uh, I, I think it was an extremely well put together and, and obviously thoroughly well researched uh, project. Thank you very much uh, for your time and trouble in putting it together. Mm. Well, yeah. Thanks very much. I was a bit concerned about two or three places where uh, the text had to go for a fair while before I had a photograph to put up on the. Um, but maybe you didn't notice that. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not quite sure how many of you were asleep. <laughs> yeah. <As if. laughs> yeah. Um it's it's interesting to note it's something I, I noted years ago is that Tasmania it, it's an absolute gold mine when it comes to uh light railways and the stuff what that we're interested in. Um and the the stories are still being written about. That's the research is still going on. It's uh mm -hmm. um the recorded record is uh, nowhere near complete of all the things that went on, even though there's been some uh, great publications come out on various railways and it, there's always yeah, seems to be something. I couldn't, couldn't agree more. Um, of course, a lot of the railways in Tasmania related to the, uh, the mining fields of the uh, West Coast, mm. um, but they're also... A lot of mining going on in the northeast, up around Ringarooma and places, and there were some tramways up in there. Uh, I had, I published a book some years ago 
of the tramways in the southern forest south of Hobart, of which there were about 600 kilometres of, of tramway over the years. And they ran from well, about 1846 until 1974. Mm. Uh, although not all, not all uh, alive at the same time, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and there are other tramways on the east coast, on the on the Tasman Peninsula. Um, and I noticed that in the data that coming came the other day from the uh, from the light railways that um, there's something coming up on the uh, is it on the Tulla rail tramways? Yeah. Yeah, got that new book coming out. It'll be available next week. Also, yeah. Um, Scott, now you you've got you come from a family that um, uh, was heavily involved in the sawmilling industry down um, the south end of uh, Tassie. Is that correct? Yes, uh, my grandfather. It started in the milling industry as a uh, an apprentice to a David Chapman, who was a leading sawmiller in the south, and he subsequently went and spent some time in the Mile Lakes area, uh, learning his trade, and then came back and became the manager of uh, Andrew Arthur's uh, mill at Ramonier in. He, in fact, was Andrew Arthur's brother-in-law, uh, which means, incidentally, that Andrew Arthur is an obscure, well, is it step-great-grandfather of mine or something? <laughs> uh, and uh, I never met, of course. Yeah. Uh, the, the family had other mills at various times at Garden Island Creek, three on Bruny Island, one at Nugent on the East Coast and various other places in around Hobart area. They weren't the biggest of the sawmillers, I suppose the Risbys or the Chestermans were that, but uh, they certainly were very much involved. Mm. Incidentally, the Andrew Arthur who um, became the uh, construction manager, if you like, of the uh, Tema Tram, He's, he was uh, the son of Henry Andrew Arthur, who was the uh, Ramonier man. So he was, in fact, he's a second cousin of mine. But I'm afraid our family had such long generations that I don't know, he would have been born, born he would have gone or died long before I was born. Uh, my father was forty six when I was born, and he was he was the eighth of nine in his family. So, and Andrew Arthur, who was his brother in law, was something like thirty years older. Mm. And Andrew Arthur was born in eighteen thirty two, and yeah. he's only two generations back from me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. three. Mm. Yeah, going back. Um... Oh, about seven or eight years ago, my wife and I were in um, Hobart and uh, we went to the Salamanca markets and there was a bloke there selling historic photos that had yeah. been mounted. And that, and, um, and I was going through them and I saw one there, oh, Planet Sawmill. And I thought, mm -hmm. oh, that'd be nice to have, yeah, because I knew you. And I thought, oh, yeah, I'll buy that. And I started to talk a little bit about it to mm -hmm. the guy and he said he was a Clannet. Yes, he was my cousin's, one of my cousin's sons. Right. Um, the youngest of my cousin's three sons. Um, and he was a bit of a lost soul, but he he got involved in, in photography work and in particular, um, what's the word, I suppose, he was improving old photographs. Yeah. Uh, and he did it all over the from photos from all over 
particularly Hobart, but all over Tasmania. Yeah. No, the, the, the photos that I saw there, he'd done a very good job of. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. He was, uh, his, Graham was his name, and unfortunately he died about a year ago. Oh, that's a bit yeah. sad. Yeah, okay. All right, has anyone got anything else they'd like to uh, contribute? No, all right. Well, if that's the case, um, thank you very much, Scott. Uh, much appreciated for your time and effort uh, in that presentation. And um, I'll say good night to you all. And uh, thank you Before all. Before you go, Bill, can I just say thank you again for the invitation to join your meetings? Um, it's a clouding over day, uh, early lunchtime in Harrow, but um, I've been sitting in my little room, um, thoroughly enjoying what I've been seeing and um, uh, appreciating the effort of the presenter um, from 10,500 miles away. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> uh, thank you very much indeed. It's very much appreciated and I wish you all the very best. Very good, Bob. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I think we'll say uh, good night to you all. and. Um, we we'll look forward to seeing you next month. Good night. Thank Good you. night, Bill. Good night, all. See you next month. Yep. Bye. Good night, all. Over to you, Frank.